Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Custodial Exchange panel, and we're going to start right now. Um, today, we are very honored to have Jed from uh, Circle slash Poloni Poloniax and Alan from Kraken. A uh, little bit background. Jed started out in crypto as a miner in the early 2013, and he was an early evangelist of Ethereum. Um, and Jet joined Circle in July 2018 and has since led listing partnerships, prioritization, and due diligence for digital assets with Poloniex, one of the world's most active crypto exchanges. He's currently leading product for crypto assets at Circle as well, uh, a world leading finance, crypto finance company that's based here in Boston that has raised 250 million in funding as over 7 million customers globally. And Alan started his crypto career by co-founding what was the Bitcoin Center in New York uh, in the early 2013 as well, so roughly the same time as Judd. Um, and I remember the space was right next to the NYSC, and it was an uh, actual live exchange for where Alan was scanning barcodes of wallet addresses um, between counterparties in an actual pit. Uh, later, Alan moved from New York to SF and became... Um, uh, and managing the business development at Kraken, and probably one of the earliest and also most secretive exchanges. Uh, Kraken started since 2011, and it's the world's largest Bitcoin exchange in euro volume li liquidity. So before we start, by raise of hands, how many of you have an account with a custodial exchange or a centralized exchange? Pretty much like most of you. Um, how about um, uh, Poloniex or Kraken? Pretty good, like one third of the audiences. Um, so let's start by talking about one of the most recent news. Um, so I think it was in uh, early February. Um, Kraken has inked a nine-figure deal uh, to buy another exchange based in the UK called Crypto Facilities, which is perceived as Kraken's making an important step into token derivatives trading. And um, uh, within five days, I think Crypto Facilities volume has jumped five times higher. So it seems to be a pretty worthwhile acquisition. Um, with the continuous hype of BMAX perpetual swap and derivative option trading as well, what do you think of the current derivative trading landscape and how do you think it's going to evolve over time? Uh, so with the, the, the CME product, for example, um, the, the Bitcoin product, um, they had a very strong uh, week a few weeks ago in which they did as much notional volume as Bitstamp. Um, so that I think that CME product is really coming into its own. And then uh, a, a different kind of product, you have BitMEX, which uh, has tremendous volume and seems to do everything the customer wants uh, based, on, based on the amount of volume they have. Um, and I think in between the two, there's, there's probably a lot of a lot of room. Just from my own personal, my own humble personal perspective, I think there's probably a lot of room somewhere between uh, CME futures and uh, and Bitmax futures. And uh, if I can impress anything upon this group while I am up here for these few minutes, I hope that I can impress upon you that. Uh, where there are opportunities to improve the market, perhaps an entrepreneur among us in this room may be the one who, who fills that space and becomes a, a billionaire that we see on the cover of Forbes in the not too distant future. Um, so there's a lot of money to be made there, I believe, in, in the space. And in a, a bear market like this, something like Deribit, though, though the liquidity isn't uh, ideal for this purpose at the moment. Something like Deribit with the options is perfect for someone who has a, a long-term hodling perspective. They know where, where crypto is going to go, and they just want to do an insurance policy. And, and options can quite easily, if you get calls and puts, they can quite easily be used as an insurance policy. Um, so this is, I think this is part of the development of a more sophisticated crypto market with more protections uh, built into it. More, not, not regulatory protections, but market protections. As, as an options contract would be. Cool, and we've seen quite a variety of different types of future contracts already. Um, do, you, do you think there's a standardization across, or should there be a standardization across the future contracts on the crypto exchanges? And um, when do you think that will happen? And um, what about options? Um, do you think it will be as standardized as the um, derivative exchanges on traditional assets we're seeing today? Uh, I, I hope, this is personal again, I hope uh, the marketplace is going to create some standardization, certainly. Um, 
I hope that's done without too much uh, regulatory, regulatory kind of force involved. Um, I think I think it's going to move in that direction certainly um, to to kind of commoditize the the contracts and there will probably be uh, kind of loan loan rangers out there that have a, their own kind of way of doing things and that'll be good for the market. The the lack of centralization makes it more likely that that there can be all kinds of different options and and this guy down here in the front row might have a different kind of perspective than what that guy over there has about what he wants and and he may be better served by this this uh, decentralized marketplace with a customer of one even he might he might find exactly what he needs. What's Poloniac's take on, on those derivative products? Um, do you see a huge demand from your existing customer group? Test, test, great. Um, so what we've definitely seen um, in terms of derivatives around this industry is you know, after the, the bear market struck and many, many folks have, you know, have taken a hit, we're, we're seeing significant interest in users wanting to participate in this market in different ways with derivative products. Um, and in terms of customer demand, it's definitely something that, that we see. Um, you know, with Poloniex, we do offer uh, leverage products and lending products to our international users. Um, and it's definitely something that, that we are continuing to explore uh, in the future. Cool. So let's let's go back a bit further than than February. Let's go back to last December, and and the biggest news will probably be about Quadriga CX. And uh, um, as some of you might know, um, about 190 million dollars was stolen uh, due to the death of its founder. And um, and it's mostly the core issue is the custody of the assets. What do you think are the most important aspects that you're looking for uh, when we're talking about custodian and is there any solutions uh, in the ecosystem that right, uh, right now that you think um, that, that you feel pretty comfortable about? Yeah, so I think there's, uh, so first of all, the Quadriga case um, is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know um, the details about that. I don't want to speculate on that. But overall, I do want to comment that it probably is quite negative for the industry that this really did get picked up by the, media cycle, I think um, like my aunt who doesn't know anything about crypto is asking me about this person. So um, yeah, I think when it comes to um, more co uh, custodial exchanges like Poloniex, um, you know, having very, very um, robust systems in place that allows us to custody assets um, without these risks, I, we can't, you know, part of the security is obviously we can't talk about um, all the different systems that we have in place, uh, but also having a you know, very regulatory-minded um, front um, uh, company uh, is really, really important, and also having um, very public presence. So on centralized exchanges in terms of like um, options, like I think there's two different customers. Um, so you, know, you kind of have like the whole, the whole the holders who have been around for a while, more like the, um, the cypherpunks and I think self-custodying uh, their assets and trading them on different DEXs I think is a, is a great option peer to peer. Uh, for the more active trader, um, I think really what we just need to do is have those robust systems in place uh, for who, who will trust us to custody their assets. Uh, with, with custodying assets, so there's a lot of uh, a great deal of security goes into crypto, of course, and um, I have nothing particularly to say about Quadriga uh, from my personal perspective. Uh, but I, I know, you know, last night, last night on the the plane as I was flying here, um, the the gentleman next to me and I we struck a struck up a conversation about Bitcoin, uh, as I'm apt to do with everyone around me at all times, as often as I can, like some people in the room perhaps, some other people. Um, and uh, he said, you know, Bitcoin's really cool, but you can just lose all your money. And he's right. And, uh, you know, my 80-year-old uncle would say the same thing. And uh, I, I've, I've heard people who are fairly savvy uh, in crypto say things to me like, now when I get big enough, how do I make sure that someone doesn't try to kidnap my, my kid? 
right? This is like, these are things that I, legitimate complaints that I hear from people in the crypto space uh, that th they are used to the, the, the funds being with a bank, with a third party, with an intermediary, uh, the funds being somewhere where they can never be taken away. Um, and we had, we had Sharon up here speaking about uh, uh, the, the, the exact need for, for uh, uh, custody, uh, custody in a way that, that uh, protects, protects the, the person who's uncomfortable custody their own. But we need, we need to remember as well uh, that, that a beautiful thing about crypto is that you can be your own bank, right? You can, you, can carry, you can carry your own resources across the border, no one can stop you. You can carry your own resources in your mind, no one can stop you, right? It, it doesn't take a whole truckload to carry things. And instead of, I, I love all these great crypto solutions that are out there, I, I, all the, the great custody solutions that are out there. And I think it's important to remember, and again, maybe there's an entrepreneur in the room who will help push this direction. It's important to remember that there's there can be great technologies like, like uh, you know, there could be the ledger type technologies, the Trezor type technologies that, that make, it, make someone even more comfortable around that root idea of crypto, of custodying your own assets. Um, because this is, this is at the core of crypto, the core of the freedom that Bitcoin has to offer. Um, maybe this guy in the front row might be the one who finally makes that product that the 80-year-old the, the talks about, that, that your aunt talks about, right? This is, this is the possibility. This is my hope of where custody will go increasingly towards, instead of being more like Charles Schwab. You all heard the next billion dollar opportunity. Um, let's, let's go back a bit further. Um, let's go back to last September. Uh, I think that was when uh, USDC was launched, um, and uh, Poloniex launched the uh, trading pairs with uh, USDC. Um, so what would the additional transparencies that you see in USDC and what do you think are the main advantages um, compared with other stable coins at this point? Yeah, with, um, with stable coins, it's quite an interesting um, dilemma that you know, we're, we and many others are trying to solve. So I'm sure we, we all have the story of, you know, um, I spent this Bitcoin or I could have mined this Bitcoin and be millionaire right now. And, you know, part of it is, I, I remember actually going to a restaurant uh, here uh, in Central Square, actually, that used to take Bitcoin uh, for sushi. So back in 2013, I, I was mining some Bitcoin and I would just quickly use it uh, for those sushi meals. Um, that place has now doubled in size. They bought the place next to them and they now have a grand piano. So. Um, you know, so looking at looking at the the kind of um, spending that money back then without a stable asset causes like some angst in me. And so, actually, I think it was two weeks ago I started. I bought some uh, pizza with the Lightning Network. Uh, you know, shout out to LM Pizza. And um, I had that same gut feeling when I eventually made that payment. That you know, I think it was like twenty three dollars in Bitcoin. And um, you know, yes, Lightning Network, it was crazy fast um, and it was really exciting, but I still had, you know, what the merchant doesn't know exactly what this is gonna be worth in the future. I don't know what's gonna be worth in the future and people are escaping to these stable assets, fiat, you know, mostly fiat. So I think at Circle, um, you know, we've seen this, this um, play out there and, you know, with the actual stable coin space, um, we've seen it kind of evolve over time. You know, the initial use case, you know, I just talked about a lot about the actual um, transactional use case, but the main use case right now is allowing uh, traders to hedge against volat volatility. And so um, the first uh, stable asset out there launched and, uh, you know, they, they made a ton of market share and they've done, done quite well, but the issue is there's questions about its regulations, banking partnerships, et cetera. The next kind of iteration of fiat-backed stablecoins, uh, and I'm not getting into like um, crypto collateralized, but um, for fiat-backed was regulated stablecoins. Um, you know, basically similar to the to the you know the first uh, incumbent, but very very strongly regulated and transparent with uh, you know their banking partners. And so, what the next iteration that Circle kind of launched is something called the Center Consortium. So it's a regulated backed a regulated uh, fiat-backed stablecoin, but there is a multi-issuer model. So 
any qualified institution can join the center consortium and um, be an issuer of whatever asset the center consortium launches. So we launched USDC, and going back to that, the, 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 the multi-issuer model, it gives, it kind of goes along with the whole crypto ethos, right? Like having not just one centralized party controlling a stable asset, allowing interoperability about across many different, um, many different uh, issuers. And uh, so allowing this is, is it's, so far it's been really great. Um, and being transparent is very important. So we do uh, assertion reports every month from Grant, Grant Thornton. Uh, and we launched it back in September. We launched USDC back in September. Um, and we're really seeing a lot of traction in the market. I believe our market capitalization is about 240 million US dollars have now been um, tokenized. And anybody can be confident that these assets are there with assetation reports and they can redeem them at any time for a dollar. Also going a little bit into the trading, uh, you know, sometimes it's a dollar two, sometimes it's 99 cents on different exchanges, but with, with the center consortium, we always can guarantee it will be um, redeemable for a dollar. So that's kind of the evolution that we've seen. Yeah, it seems like USDC definitely have a significant stake in the market share nowadays. Yep. Um, and. Uh, for Alan, I'm wondering, what's your take uh, on stable coins? It, it seems like um, Kraken has um, sort of preferred the route of um, expanding a bit more across fiat currencies. Uh, I believe now the top five um, forex fiat currencies are all listed on uh, Kraken. So, what's your perspective on that? I think Jed said plenty. Um, and uh, sorry, no, you it was it was too Jed, much, Jed, too much. No, 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 no. Um, the the uh, uh, there's a lot of friction going into crypto. Um, there's a lot of friction in the banking environment. It makes stable coins make sense uh, to help alleviate that friction from my perspective. Um, and the, the, there's, there's lots of room for improvement. <clears throat> entrepreneurs in the room want to be entrepreneurs looking for the, the next great idea. Um, or, or if you don't want the next, uh, if you don't just want to go out alone and do the next great idea by yourself, come talk to me because we we need talent at Kraken, and, and if you want to work in crypto, come talk to me right after. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Everyone in the room can come talk to me. I'll stay all night and talk to you about working at Kraken. Okay, I'm done. By the way, Alan is only staying for one night, uh, and uh, we're, we're here no, all the no. time, guys. All the time. <laughs> we're based in Boston. <laughs> Get your resumes ready. <laughs> okay, now we're talking about trading pairs. Um, well, let, let's take a look at another dimension. Um, let's talk, talk about new listings. It seems like um, Poloniex has a much more uh, variety of crypto assets uh, under the exchange. Uh, I believe it's 121 uh, as we speak. Um, what's sort of the process of uh, having new tokens launched on your exchange? and? What are some of the things that you look at? Because some of the audiences, um, they have their own token projects, right? Yeah, so Poloniex uh, was started, I believe, in um, January 2014. And it really had a reputation in the industry of being on the cutting edge of the most interesting um, crypto assets. Um, I believe Ether Classic was, they were the first ones to list Ether Classic. We were one of the early ones to list Ethereum. and so. We want to continue being on the cutting edge of, of listings, and it's a really important component uh, to um, you know the, the product suite that we're offering. So, yeah, currently we have over six, six different assets, and I think it's yeah over like 120 different pairs. And the process of actually listing is is uh, quite um, you know for a regulated exchange uh, like us, it's quite um, intense. Um, so it's a lot like a sales funnel. Um, we have. Inbound token teams that will apply um, at Poloniex, we do some outbound research and we'll reach out to these teams and uh, kind of start the conversations with them, learn more about their products, uh, their projects, and then um, you know, kind of do some general research. Uh, when we kind of bring it to the next stage down the funnel, it goes a, like much deeper, so we'll do a very deep, detailed um, risk analysis based on uh, securities risks and also uh, the engineering implementation and engineering risk. Um, and also, um, we look at the business case of actually having this asset, you know, in terms of market dynamics and um, demand for it. You know, the biggest piece that, that like, I think is really important, um, what we look at, there's a variety of things, but one is the actual problem that these 
um, the, that these, these pro token projects are, are solving? You know, is there actually a problem that needs distributed ledger technology, or is there not? And if there is, what are like other competitors are doing, and how are they actually, um, you know, actually solving this problem? You know, we look at a lot of different things. Uh, like I said, we look at the market demand. Uh, we look at the team. I think that's really important. Uh, do they have experience with uh, past uh, blockchain or open source technology, or they have big exits? Uh, we look at investors. We look at the distribution of their GitHub, for example, and kind of do a very thorough analysis. And again, I, I can't stress enough, the, the really big thing that, that, that is important is um, the securities versus the utility of the token. So what is the purpose of the token? And um, is it needed to actually run that network? So um, yeah, it's quite in depth. Um, and uh, we kind of run it through all the way up to our executive team for each uh, listing. And uh, you know, we've listed quite some, some interesting assets um, over the past year. And uh, we're excited to see how it goes. Cool. So if you have any token projects you want to launch, uh, feel free to talk with Jed afterwards. Uh, and for the last topic, uh, we're going to talk, we're going to go into um, regulations a bit. Um, Alan, you previously worked um, on the exchange floor at Chicago Board of Trade and Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the um, S&P uh, options, right? Um, and later you moved to New York and co-founded the Bitcoin Center until the bit license came out. Um, um, and in contrast, very interestingly, um, Circle sort of took a different approach and Circle was the first to get the bit license. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts on the current regulations in New York uh, versus Chicago, and what do you think are the states? Um, you know, if someone wants to set up a crypto venture, uh, you know, maybe uh, with a money transmitter license or something, what do you think are the best states that they should register the company? So, imagine this. Imagine the scene in like 2013, 2014, where like you you can be right next door to the New York Stock Exchange. You can be right next door, uh, walking down the street, and there's this Bitcoin poster, and you're like, what the heck? And you walk in, and you stand there, and over the course of the day, you might see a 1,000 people walk through this place. Big open room, and it's just there to learn about Bitcoin, for people to get together, and, and maybe they might trade with each other, maybe they might uh, ask a few questions, maybe they just finish their, uh, an 18-hour coding session, they just want to be with each other, be, be social. And it was this super vibrant space that really rivaled the Silicon Valley crypto space. And super exciting, there are documentary films made about this place. And uh, then, then this like, pretty bad regulation comes into place um, that just kind of like quashes it all. And it's almost, you know, it's like regulation that like a bank would write if it really hated Bitcoin. And, uh, and then uh, you, you, it, became, it became more of a crypto desert than it was before, sadly. Um, but like, the innovation didn't stop. The innovation moved to other places. And some of those places were Chicago. And right now when I step into crypto events in Chicago, it's pretty exciting stuff. And that's like super exciting to me to watch. Um, and you have other places that, you know, they levy strange taxes on places like California kind of does that. Or, and these are, these are my personal opinions, my personal observations. Um, or you have, uh, you have places like New Hampshire. New Hampshire's got kind of cool crypto regulation. You know, New Hampshire's crypto regulation is something like, uh, go get a business license and then go do business. That's awesome. <laughs> or, you know, so that's like the most cool idea of how crypto regulation could work that just the legislature says, we're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna let the industry thrive and check back with us in 10 years or something like that. But uh, Wyoming took a little bit of a different approach and they said, you know what, there needs to be a little bit of clarity. Wyoming recently passed some laws where, where uh, they added some regulatory clarity in, in a way that's like really welcoming to crypto companies to move there. Um, and this is, this New Hampshire, Wyoming approach uh, is, is kind of exciting to watch um, as, as states are kind of battling uh, for, for the potential to, to be where, where this innovation happens instead of battling to be the person who chases the, the potential away as if a bank wrote a piece of regulation for them. Uh, yeah, so um, the way I look at regulations, especially um, in the 
collateral centralized exchange space is it's quite uh, interesting the way that this space has evolved uh, from the regulatory standpoint. So, you know, we've seen our competitors, we've seen many centralized exchanges kind of jump jurisdictions based on where the guidelines evolve to. So, one issue that we're seeing is, is the unclear uh, regulatory guidelines that we don't have any industry standards. Um, and so, this kind of opens up, an, a, like, I'd say, a short window opportunity. Uh, to you know, to keep switching jurisdictions to be able to offer you know securities products, um, you know all kinds of different um, derivatives, etc. So um, it's it's quite a unique place to be in when um, you know you're basically competing with um, others who can be more flexible with what they offer their customers. So like we, in terms of like Circle and Poloniex uh, being extremely regulated, um, we really, really uh, carefully uh, tread on, on what we can do based on SEC guidelines and, and different regulatory body, body, uh, body guidelines. And it's almost like playing on two different uh, playing fields. Um, I think it's a short term opportunity. Um, and I think what we're seeing, we're starting to see this pay some dividends um, in the future. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of that. That's kind of the, the, the reality of the, of the markets. It's, it's still, re I mean, Bitcoin's been around for ten years, but it's still re relatively early in terms of trading this. And until we get some clear regulatory guidelines, um, it's going to be uh, we're going to continue to see this. Cool. Um, now I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, uh, we're going to start the Q and A session. Um, and um, Alan Jed, this is your chance to. Uh, uh, well, we have two thirds of the audiences being the potential user for Circle and Kraken. So this is your chance, and for the audiences, um, this is your chance to possibly negotiate some uh, trading fee reductions. <laughs> All right. Hi. So this is more—it's part comment, part question, I suppose. But um, so I'm kind of experiencing—you know—I've started a fund um, that trades you know, crypto, does some portfolio management, and has been trying to get in kind of the repo stuff. And you know, there's obviously your Genesis's and your. Uh, Genesis and uh, what's the other one, Cumberland, that do uh, coin repo. And uh, one of the frustrations that I've had, you know, coming from a traditional markets background where, you know, you're used to facing an established um, exchange, uh, traditional exchange, let's say, um, like be it the CME for futures or whatever, um, it's a lot easier to do some kind of diligence, like a credit check, but places like Cumberland or, um, or Genesis um, and some of the other ones have, uh, it's been very difficult to try to find, uh, do proper credit checks on them um, or you know, get the get collateral in exchange for that, and so I see as that as a kind of a bottleneck um, to where kind of the the fund areas can go, and that's been a, a source of frustration for me. Along with you know, obviously KYC ML, which is kind of a universal concern. But um, as you guys evolve into the derivative space, uh, are, do you guys have have you is that kind of on your roadmap for things that you're trying to address, or what are, what are some of the solutions that you guys have been talking about with respect to that? <laughs> Uh, this you're you're uh, you know you're pointing to you're pointing to uh, it's a young marketplace and there's lots of needs to that need to be filled. Uh, you're you're pointing to one of them, um, and I'm I'm listening. That's 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 my answer. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is John, so I'm an alum of MIT, and I work in the trading infrastructure space. And my question is with respect to what kind of general direction you guys see your particular businesses maturing into, and more so where you're seeing that come from an industry level. And specifically what I mean is, so for instance, from traditional markets, right, you have brokers, clearing houses, exchanges, banks that fulfill several steps in the pipeline of investing. And I know from Circle's perspective, you guys have done a great job of Poloniex acquiring, building out more OTC transactions, actually establishing various parts of that infrastructure. And I'm curious, similarly, from Kraken's repositioning lately and everything, about how you guys view it. So the broad question is, as the industry matures, what steps do you guys particularly believe that you're well positioned to take on? And what steps do you think might actually look very different in crypto versus traditional finance? Thanks. So there's going to be... Uh technology build-outs that there would be, like, there used to be a telephone monopoly in the United States. Um, and you would have, you would have uh, these economists who would talk about natural monopoly theory, 
and they were Harvard economists, and they were government economists, and they'd be on the news, and they'd say, this is the only way you can do it. There can only be one telephone company in, in an area. That's the only possible way. Uh, and then you'd have like this free market economist who'd be like, you know, I don't know what it'll look like, but I just know it's gonna be better. And then, you know, they'd all jump on him, and oh, what, you want three buttons on your telephone? You want three phone lines down the, the street? It's gonna make all our neighborhoods ugly. What's wrong with you? And, and the free market economists had no idea what, there was nothing, nothing to say. And this is, we're, we're in this moment, you know, you go, there was this, this telephone monopoly for 80 years in the US, and there was almost no technological development. And then you go from, from a, a period of no monopoly to 24 years later, merely 24 years later, right? Everyone used to have these, this clunky rotary phone that, that existed from like World War II to the 80s. Almost every house in the US had the same phone. Then 24 years later, you end up with, with uh, people, everyone walk around with a supercomputer in their pocket, right? This is the development of simply stepping away and letting things happen. Now. This is a technology that we have. What's going to be different from the traditional financial space is that you can't put this in the box, right? You can't, you're not going to have a bunch of companies that all look the same. There's, going to, there's also going to be a bunch of companies that all look the same, but there's going to be all these companies doing like crazy things that you and I never imagined before. And this is going to be, this is, it's money, right? This is, this is a, a, a reshaping of what money means now. And what does it mean when a billion Africans can, can suddenly access a bank? Right? I have no idea what that means. And, and there's going to be entrepreneurs perhaps in this room who, who shape that future. I don't know, but it's not gonna look, there's gonna be stuff that, that models itself over after the current financial system, but there's gonna be so much more. Like your kids are gonna grow up knowing about money in a way that, that you never envisioned it. And it's gonna be an amazing thing, unless we let it all go into some crappy little box which I don't think can even possibly happen. It, it's gonna be amazing. So, also, um, I think, I think to, to kind of echo um, that, that ethos, it still is early and we're seeing the space evolve and um, you know, mirroring traditional market products is something that kind of uh, we're seeing, with, especially with the proliferation of uh, DeFi applications. Uh, you know, um, and, and we're kind of seeing that potentially becoming the next kind of killer app. I think one thing that we are really taking a look at is something we you know we call the tokenization of everything. So um, really being able to open up capital markets to anybody in the world um, that wants to basically uh, fund from the crowd. So going beyond just, tr the, so, so quickly about Circle, we acquired uh, Seed Invest pretty recently um, that just finished uh, FINRA approval. And we've been really taking this um, space quite seriously. And you know, again, going beyond just like Delaware shares uh, that are tokenized, we are really thinking that you know, there could be a, you know, somebody in maybe a developing nation that has a yield-bearing um, farm that maybe want, needs, wants to raise money from, from the crowd and they can tokenize that. You know, we've seen tokenized real estate. And so we're actually thinking there's not gonna just be hundreds or thousands of coins uh, or tokens, but there'll be, you know, potentially millions. So securities, security tokens, STOs, um, we've invested in and we really do think that, that, that that's kind of where a good direction of, of where the space is going. Awesome. So I, I think we're a little bit over time, but uh, if there's any remaining questions, I think um, Jed and Alan will be free in a minute uh, right outside, and you can come down and uh, ask them questions. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jed, and thank you so much, Alan, for sharing with us today. Thanks a thank lot. You. Thank Thanks, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Parker.